Hey everyone, welcome once again to another installment of the Conversations That Matter podcast. I'm your host, John Harris, as always. And I have a special guest I'm excited to, well, I guess, not really introduce because Stephen's been on the program before. But for those who haven't heard those episodes, we have Stephen Wolf with us today, who just released this book here, The Case for Christian Nationalism. And it's it's actually kind of a long book. I read the whole thing because I really, uh, it was actually very enjoyable, but I wanted to also um, understand it uh, to the, the best of my ability so I can ask Stephen some good questions. And um, some of you have also submitted some questions uh, from Patreon. And so we'll see how many of those we get to. But uh, Stephen, thank you so much for being willing to talk about this and give some of your time to the audience here. Yeah, I mean, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. My I think this is my third or fourth time. I think, yeah, so third. It's, it's always fun to come on the show. Yeah, I think you, uh, hey, man, no, it is your fourth. I think you're right. Cause I think you did one solo and then two with Thomas. And uh, so okay. now you're solo again. But uh, I'm going to ask you the most generic question that any, anyone asks yeah. authors Why did you write this book? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. That's always the first question. It's always, um, yeah. You have to. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the funny thing, it was, I was making a joke actually last night because I was tweeting, doing late night tweeting, um, and I was outside smoking, <laughs> uh, which I sometimes do to think and contemplate and all that. And, uh, he's Presbyterian. Uh, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh Oh, I, we just alienated half the audience. The fundamentalist. No, but on. no, but I was actually just tweeting one day a, a few years ago and uh, a couple of years ago. And I was like, well, you know what? All, everyone's talking about Christian nationalism. What if I wrote a book on that? And I think I sent that out and then. Then Jake at Jake McAtee at uh, Canon then sent me a message saying, "Hey, pitch a uh, send a pitch, you know, for the for a book uh, on that." And I was like, "All right." Uh, but before that, I was I was thinking like, okay, they're they're using this term Christian nationalism. They're throwing it out, and it's supposed to be bad. And uh, I've said this several times on different shows, but like the conservative impulse is to think, "Oh, they're accusing me of something. I must not be that. I must say I'm not that," and, and repeatedly say I'm not that and run from it and right um which is just ridiculous and silly why we do things like that but anyway uh you want to deconstruct deconstruct that but when i when i thought of the uh the the term i was like wait a second it's, i'm a national i love my nation i'm a nationalist and i'm a christian and why, why not be a christian nationalist i want to see my nation ordered to uh the things of god and heavenly life and so i was like well we should just i think it's a good term uh and we just adopt it own it uh and um, eventually they'll call us like Christo, Christo fascists and they'll look ridiculous. Um, but just own, <laughs> own the term and, um, uh, and, and, but, but why, like, why own the term? Uh, I know this might be your second question, but I'll just get there. Right yeah, first. go for it. Um, but yeah, the, why own the term? Well, because I think what we need, what Christians need today is to have a sort of an active, um, assertive political posture and have this sort of spirit for, nat for for their own good, for their national good, is for decades we've had a very uh, like a passive approach to politics. I mean, it, it, you have this exemplified in in you know, like the, the the theology, the political theology, if you want to call it that, of someone like Russell Moore. Uh, and the typical evangelical position on politics is that we just be winsome and and uh, non-assertive. But I say what you, what what we do need, what Christians need, is a, a will to live, and they need a justification to act in this world for their good, not only their temporal good, but also their eternal good. And so, you know, I'm going to write that, um, that, that book. And that's what I did. I mean, so it's, it's, it's not just regurgitated reform political thought. You'll see me quoting every from everyone from Calvin to Bob Inc and everyone in between. Uh, uh, but so it's not just that, but th there is that. Um, but it's, it's also saying we Christians need to have this, this assertive will for our good. And this includes in a way taking, uh, taking the public institutions, um, for Christ, ordering them to heavenly life. And so I tried to present a framework and arguments for that in the book. Well, it's an excellent book and it, it's definitely written at a more academic level. Uh, but I think that is what's necessary, uh, at least initially, uh, because what I'm hoping is that, and I'm sure you're hoping this, that this book inspires a number of related books to come out and Christians to be, as you just said, uh, less sheepish, more aggressive, uh, more willing to defend themselves against a, uh, a really what amounts to a very aggressive anti-Christian establishment. 
one of the things that I thought, uh, because I've been friends with you on, at least on social media for years, is a lot of what you write about, you've been saying this for years, long before Christian nationalism was a pejorative. And so I was kind of curious, are, are these, I mean, how long did it take you to write this? Was this a recent uh, thing or did you have fragments sitting around for years that you just kind of thought, wait, this is the moment for this? Uh, I mean, well, so I, I wrote a dissertation. I wrote two master's theses, and so I had a lot of writings, but only only one chapter is kind of directly pulled from that work. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I've I've been for a long time. I've I've been a, a follower of every everyone from you know Francis Turretin to Roger Scruton, and you can see that influence within the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, it took me about I guess it took me about a year and a half to write um, uh, while doing other. things things so yeah that's impressive yeah and i didn't expect it to be 500 pages or as long as it was um but uh, like you said it, it is kind of it isn't a sort of academic level work though i think people i i mean it yeah it's if you pick up a typical academic work it's it's there are differences well but um you can but work the, the, through it even if you're not academic you can work through this and and yeah, gain yeah, so I, much from it you don't have to be an academic yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, the the point was that the the way I thought it is that okay, my my world academically, you know, is like 17th century political thought, um, and I, so I read people like you know um, Samuel Rutherford, and you see the way they present their arguments, and and if you read like Lex Rex, and then you read my book, you'll see some like pattern similarities between not only the arguments but also also the method, and what I like about that is they actually thought. Critically, they they said their argument has to be demonstrated. It, the question has to be clear. Like what question are you answering? Uh, you have to make distinctions between principle and prudence. Uh, you have to have definitions. You have to make crucial distinctions. But the the problem in most political, I guess, works you see today, it, it treats the reader as like a child. Like it, it treats them, it treats yes. Christians as if they they live their life on Twitter and they can't think beyond like tweetables, like tweets. And so they treat them as like this bundle of sentiments that they kind of appeal to in different places to kind of construct an argument instead of making something that's demonstrated. So I, so even though like, I, I don't want people to think, Oh, this is academic trying to speak to, you know, uh, it, it's more like I'm, I'm a, I'm a guy, I'm a man trying to speak to other men saying you're a rational being you can think clearly and I'm going to treat you as such, not, not as a student, not as a, but as a fellow guy saying, here's my argument as it equals now, you know, take, take with it what you'll, you know, what you will. But, um, it, it was, it was just like treating people as adults. And I, I just, and I think that if you, oh, if you read it, and I hope that's the impression you get. And then you pick up like, a you know, some, some work by one of these, evangelical elites on politics you say these guys are treating us like kids and I, oh i, I, I did exactly that yeah because i was simultaneously while i was reading yours i was reading uh samuel perry's book um, <laughs> taking america back for god so and i just thought this is it's embarrassing in some ways to read samuel perry because it's uh, so it's muddier it's just not on the same level you quote you know source after source after source showing how steeped in uh, the reform tradition, but not just the reform tradition, just Western tradition in general, you are, and you're very knowledgeable about th these subjects. You can take them all, kind of weave them together into a cohesive narrative, which takes skill and, and understanding and years of work. And it's uh, pretty airtight, so many of the things you argue. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's refreshing to see that for me, just because I've had, I, I haven't, done as much schooling as you have but i do have two master's degrees and um and it is frustrating to read some really good works of antiquity that christians have produced and then to see what's on the top 10 of cbd <laughs> you know and, and yeah, you're I mean, doing so well so um, yeah and, and, and i want to i want to yeah i appreciate everyone who's been helping me it's like almost like a grassroots thing just random guys i don't even know <laughs> they're like oh i'm so excited to read the book and they post a picture so i really appreciate that but just take just take like the subtitles of some of these books, like um, and, uh, you know, it's like what what is I don't have I forget it, but I think even like do uh the 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 Jesus John Wayne book has something about corrupting the faith, and and then I th there's this Andrew Whitehead book coming out that says something more like corrupting corrupting the uh, the gospel, 
Yeah. And it's just, you, you open these guys up and, and like, who, what do you, what are you talking about? Like, do, do you yourself even understand the gospel? Like, do you, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's just, it's treating, let me put it this way. It treats the, it, it assumes that the reader is ignorant because you'd have to, in order to have, be that bold to say all these people are like corrupting the gospel, you'd, you'd have to kind of assume that these people don't know anything about the Protestant tradition on what the gospel is right you know and you, you, they they are they literally treat they have to like to make that sort of argument they'd have to just say yeah my readers are ignorant i'm just going to assert these things oh it's insulting um, totally. yeah it should be it should be because yeah and i i try to show it's like yeah here are my arguments but also hey you know what like turton said the same thing luther said bobbing like all these guys said the same thing yeah you know? and and so if you're going to say like i think andrew whitehead's it's like his his subtitle it comes out next year um it says something like, yeah, it's like how Christian nationalism corrupts the gospel. It's like, okay, well, I mean, I'm citing everyone. I'm citing dozens of people uh, from these, from, from the reformation to post-reformation era. I mean, that's, there's a lot of friendly fire going on if, if I'm corrupting the gospel, even though he hasn't actually probably read the book yet. But anyway, right. the, the point being, I know I'm kind of rambling on here. <laughs> no, you're good. The, the, the point being is that like, if you guys read the book, it's, it's meant to treat you as rational beings, not just flighty, you know, emotional. Yeah. Bundles, it gives you a lot to chew on. Tweets and, yeah. and it also, uh, there's just so many assumptions, assumptions, fundamental assumptions to some extent uh, to our current order that you challenge that I think it's going to require people to just think outside the box for that reason, because uh, yeah, I've never thought, you know, about the basis for a revolution or whether it's right or wrong or um, so, some of the just fundamental assumptions I think we have about men and women and, and about what a nation is. And just we, we go around life without arguing for these things. And you kind of get behind that and uh, question some things, which uh, is is also refreshing because a lot of these are, are questions that I've had. And some of them, some of the things you advocate are viewpoints I've had for a long time, but no one's really articulated them, at least not recently in uh, Christian spheres. And you go back a hundred years, especially you start seeing a richness that just doesn't exist. And you brought that back. Uh, you, you reintroduce people to some older thinkers who had some profound things to say. So thank you for that. Um, I thought maybe what we would do now is just jump into, I, I have, I think I told you before we started recording, I have like seven pages, single space of, quotes and questions and we won't get to all of them obviously but i thought i would start with just um probably the the thing that people have tangled over the most over the last two years which is a definition for christian nationalism because uh it's used as you just said i think um maybe it was before we were recording but it's used as a pejorative so often and it's i think the first time i heard someone use it was uh right around the election uh, in 2020. And it, maybe it was Beth Moore. She made a tweet that went and got famous when there was some kind of a rally in DC. And she talked about how this was the greatest chat. It was again, what you were talking about, like the greatest challenge to the gospel she's seen in her lifetime, Christian nationalism. And all of a sudden I saw it everywhere. And um, you have a book that's so steeped in tradition and and you prove it, but yet, and maybe this is a critique, I don't know. The term Christian nationalism, though, you you don't you you address it. You say, I don't I'm not going to go back to fascists. I'm not going to people who have used the term nationalism or Christian nationalism. You're kind of selective and you you pick uh, some kind of more obscure uses of the term to justify your use of it. So I was curious to hear from you um, what what Christian nationalism is. And I, I do have the definition here, but in your own words, what is it? And then why did you feel okay with using this term, even though it's it's being used as a pejorative against us? So you, you don't talk about like the Bellamy clubs or, you know, uses of the term from like a hundred years ago that were more negative and not what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, yeah, again, I, I like I said earlier, I think that it's, it, uh, the nat, well, the nationalist tradition, uh, kind of has, um, it, it, it emphasizes more the national will to live. And so I, I think this, the West and is kind of has this will to die. 
And so I think it's important for this moment to emphasize. I mean, I, I do think you could say something like, you know, Calvin was a sort of Christian nationalist, maybe a, a, a Christian city statist, <laughs> however you want to, you know. And I, uh, you, you could say that post Reformation England is Christian nationalist. So that there, but but I think the importance of of the term now is that it's it's bringing to kind of consciousness this national will to 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 not just survive and not just avoid suicide or whatever, but to actually to live and assert ourselves to live well. Um, so th that's kind of the general intent, and that that is reflected throughout. I think the book. Um, but yeah, so like so why? I mean, in terms of the the, the definition, the people I think are going to be really surprised by the definition I give is it's, it's also kind of, it's, it's a little, people t tend to think, well, it's a, it's a Christian nationalism is fighting so that uh, for your country to have Christian values. Like people say things like that. And I was like, well, it's, it's not, the definition is not so much a movement like Christian nationalism. It, it, there should be a, a Christian nationalist movement, but in itself, it's not so much like a movement. It's a, it's a, it's a state of things within a nation. I mean, what, what does it mean to be a Christian um, nation that is uh, that that is Christian nationalist. Well, it means that you recognize yourself, that is the the people, the 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 we, you know, the uh, as Christian, we're a Christian nation, and as such, we're going to act collectively for our national good, and that national good is going to be both our the good of our temporal life and the good of our eternal life. And so, the way the the summary of the basically the summary of the definition, I have a more extensive definition, but the summary of the definition is basically. A Christian nation uh, with the self-understanding or self-conception of it as such, as a Christian nation, and acts for its good, both earthly and heavenly good. And so th that's really that's that's the that's the idea. It's um, uh, so so again, I think we have to then for, for you know a Christian nation has to come has to go from uh, uh, of being kind of a Christian nation kind of in itself to say, no, we need to be for ourselves. We need to say we are this and we have to act for it. Um, so that, that's kind of the general overview of the, of the definition. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, it, I mean, this, it sounds to me like is an active commandeering in your mind. It's a very self-aware commandeering of a term that's being used to smear us. So this isn't, um, you, you kind of admit that this isn't necessarily the term itself rooted in, uh, in every iteration of the use of this term, uh, your, your definition of it. And in, in other words, the, you know, yeah. yeah. So I think, I think we're getting at is that, yeah. So when I use nationalist, I'm not, when I define it, I don't go off and say, okay, let's look at these different cases right. of nationalist fascism. There's like weird Finnish fascism or fascism. There's nationalism in East Asia, you know, Southeast Asia, um, uh, so what 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 does it mean? And th therefore, I come up with a definition. That that's that's what sociologists do, and it's it's frankly really boring. Um, so what <laughs> what I did, and it's just you know, and that's why they have just bad works on this. But um, but so what I what I did is that it's it's uh, conceptually, what does it mean to be nationalist? Just as a you know, kind of like as a philosophical concept, what well, means you're a nation? Is it's national nationalist? And what does the ism or the ist means? It just means that you as the people are going to say, yeah, we're going to strive for our good. Like I just, that that's just what, it, in that sense, it's less controversial until you start to getting, getting into, well, what does it mean to strive for your good? Uh, but, uh, but it just, it shouldn't be controversial that a nation as, as, as a nation would seek its good. I, I think so because that's, I, uh, that's it. That's, that's all I basically define it as. Um, right. I, mean, I think because I approach this from a historical angle and, and I think, and you say you, you approached it more from a political theory angle, right? Yeah. That when I was looking at the different, uh, iter well, at least in America, how this term was used, um, I, I was running into proto fascist types and you know, like the Bellamy clubs. And that was the first real, uh, you know, big, uh, I guess, concerted effort to use the term Christian nationalism specifically, but they were talking about socialism. And then, after the Nazis, the term nationalism becomes more in use and the word patriotism starts to fade out more. And I thought when this first started happening that you're Christian nationalists, I think I had a, probably the similar reaction to what you were saying not to do or um, but maybe for a different motive uh, that it wasn't that I wanted to run from the term because but but it was more that I I, I felt like the left was trying to call us Nazis. They couldn't really do it. So they were trying to figure out, well, what's a 
an adjacent term that we can use that's been used in the past. We'll just pick it back up. And what, what I think I'm getting at it or asking you is like, is when you're picking up the term and you're using it, cause, cause the, the way you define it, I mean, I can't really seem to argue with it. Like this is, uh, this is a good thing. This is a Christian thing, but are you being innovative yourself? Is this your own? I'm just going to take this term for myself and now define it. And since I have the top Amazon book on the topic, it's my <laughs> term and I yeah. get to do that because everyone's looking at me or uh, is this something that is rooted somewhere else? Is I mean, is it rooted in the pejoratives against us or is it, is it rooted it like where, where are you getting the term to use it this way? And, and I'm not trying to challenge you in a, I'm not like arguing against you. I'm just genuinely curious because I know people are going to get this question. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you, so, you I mean, cite so a few. I, I, Go ahead. I, I do. So I don't. Yeah. I, I mean, it, I guess in a way it's, it, it's, I've, you can say, commandeer the term and defined it how I want. Um, and and I, okay. I guess there, there is a certain element to that. But that being said, I, I do say in the book that it's that, Again, I'm not going to like go through these different cases and say, well, what is it, you know, from there, and then and then say, well, it's not this. I'm not Nazi. I'm not fascist. I'm, it's just that's just so boring. So I didn't. I'm not going to do the whole disavowal game. I had just sim- simply straight up said that uh, I'm going to define it kind of as I want, as I, as I understand it conceptually, and this becomes reflected through the book. So I go on and I define what a nation is, and then I talk about what a Christian nation right. is, and then I talk about what Christian national the ism of Christian nationalism as I work through it. And so I, I would just ask that if, if people get hung up on, on the term, I mean, I, I just, just say, just, just kind of get over it, you know, because I, I'm just not, I, I mean, I know people like they have these questions and they, they somehow want to fit the term into how it's like historically used and all that. Uh, I mean, I just say, just, I don't, I don't mean that in a demeaning way. I just, no, I'm, no, just you're saying, good. I'm, I'm just not doing it. I'm just not doing that. And yeah, so, we can't help um, it as historians though, too. So we're- yeah, I, I know. But, um, but, but I mean, cite... but the, but the thing is, like with nationalism, it's so. I, one reason I didn't want to get into that debate is because that could be like an that is like volumes of on its in itself. Like, what is nationalism? Yeah. What is fascism? Like even like even the literature on fascism, even though you have these these like these dopey academics saying that like, like trying to define here are the six like here's what the ten things of fascism, but I mean it's really highly contested even what fascism is. And so am I really going to wade into that debate and try to, and try to pull from this and say, it's not Hitler. It's not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So I'm just going to go with the terms. I'm going to define them conceptually and the people who want a sociological or historical analysis will just have to do their own thing. <laughs> gotcha. Well, you <laughs> do, best I, I, could say. <laughs> I should point out you do uh, cite like people like William Fremantle and TC Chow and Albert uh, Kleege and, um, so yeah, you, that's you, just like a short kind of literature review of how it has been used. To, but yeah, in yeah. similar ways to the way you're using it, though. So it's not completely you're not going to be completely innovative. There are people in the past who have used this term in the way that you're using it. So um, anyway, yeah, because yeah. we, we got to probably move on to the meat here because uh, this is more. <laughs> the, 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 it's just uh, I, I've seen the arguments are so often over the term. So I, I figured we had to at least. Yeah, I know that that's fine yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, one of the things you say, and this is, I, I, there's some, so many statements in this that I think, wow, like I was reading, like, this is really going to challenge the consensus, but here's the first one I came across. The gospel does not supersede, abrogate, eliminate, or fundamentally alter generic nationalism. It assumes and completes it. That's on page 11. Mm. And so this, I think some Christians are going to be startled when they read something like that. And they're going to ask, how does the gospel assume and complete nationalism? Because they've been so trained in that the politics (laughs) is over there and civil society is over there and the gospel is this wholly other thing. So uh, could you just flesh that out for us? Yeah, I'm guessing that's it from the introduction, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah. So, uh, well, it makes sense if you read the rest of the work, what I'm saying. So again, like you have to, like, if you have to take the definition of nationalism that I provide instead of these little, these like swirly concerns you have in your head. I'm not talking to you, but the reader, right, I got you. You, like you have to, so to understand what I'm saying. And, and what I mean is that I get in a sense that as I define it and as I discuss it through the other chapters, nationalism is natural. Uh, and by which I mean that, and I argue that like that Adam and, and his kind of progeny would spread across the earth. There'd be separate distinct nations. I, I make arguments for this. 
And uh, as I define nationalism, that they, these separate entities, these you know, called quasi separate, whatever you want to call them, these nations um, on Earth would seek after their national good, just because they're they're a collective people. They they are a um, in, in a sense like Aristotle talked about how the the polis is this seeks after and has self sufficiency. These people uh, who are in the, this common polis or this common nation would seek after their good, and so nationalism is uh, in this in this case would be these people recognize themselves as a people and seeking after that that good for themselves um and that and when i say the gospel does not supersede or abrogate that i'm simply saying that just follows from the principle that grace does not destroy nature it assumes and perfects it and which means that uh if if i'm right that nationalism is a sort of natural thing then it doesn't abrogate or supersede it or whatever it it, it actually perfects that which would perfect it into Christian nationalism. <laughs> uh, so that that's the argument. Uh, and, and yeah, but I, I, as you stated, if you just leave that alone, people will just, they'll lose their minds, but you just have to follow the argument and you'll understand what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and you do obviously expand on that. I even have a quote on page 15. You say nations have the power to ensure that outwardly the things of salvation, the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments are available to all and that people are encouraged, even culturally expected to partake and be saved unto eternal life. And I mean, obviously, uh, unquestioned until five seconds ago, unquestioned until modernity. Um, yeah, I mean that—that's something. Yeah, it's—it's it's strange when people kind of freak out about that. Yeah, uh, when when um, I, there's even like Baptists doing work now saying like, yeah, I mean, this 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 like post you know world uh, Warren Court uh, notion of religious liberty that that's Baptist didn't believe that. This oh is, yeah, it's all just so. But but I mean yeah just apart from some of the questions about the Baptists I mean yeah all press like Presbyterians and and Anglicans and just pretty much everyone believe that that there had that that in some sense outwardly civil society and even government can kind of encourage uh, or pr promote true religion so yeah, I mean I was I mean seminary. there are questions of like I mean that that's true in principle there are questions of how and I you know I get into this. There are questions of like, well, is it, it what's suitable given the circumstances of each place? So I don't mm -hmm. like someone, someone on Twitter the other day was like, well, I, you didn't provide a form for like church establishment. And I, I, I you need to provide a form. And I was like, well, I mean, it, it depends on what the people want. I mean, or, or you could be like a divine law Presbyterian and say, no, it must be Presbyterians everywhere. Uh, but I, that's that's a job for the theologians. But just ge but general, but in in general, it, it's a it's a question of the circumstances of the you know time and place of how that's going to be established. But but in we, principle, you, it's justified. You do say, and I can't remember where it is in the book that you think the American founding essentially, or at least at that time period, they basically got it right. Which um, I agree with you because I mean they had thirteen different colonies, and there were differences, obviously, in state religions in, in these different places and so forth. So um, it's not like there hasn't been a precedent already. That's like literally we're standing in where we're, we're yeah. uh, but I, what you said about Baptist. So, so true. <laughs> it's, I remember when I was at seminary, just an off uh, handed uh, uh, comment here that uh, we were basically told in class, Baptists were responsible for secularism. And isn't that a good thing? And um, <laughs> of course they called it principal pluralism, but, uh, yeah. And and this was the other denominations were bad, right? They wanted to suppress everyone, but the Baptists believed in freedom. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, I do have a chapter on that where I basically I, I give the I give the credit not to the Baptists but to the um, Congregationalists and the Presbyterians for. Right. I mean, Baptists like to cite their favorite sources from like the mid seventeenth or eighteenth century, and um, but yeah, I, I just basically say that no, uh, the, and, and I say that I, well, I say that the founding and that era in terms of religious liberty was, wasn't a, was not a step away from the principles of Protestant, uh, political thought on, on religious freedom and freedom of conscience. It was actually a sort of culmination of experience. It's where Protestants said, Hey, we can work together despite our differences. You know, you're. Um, you know, Virginia's Anglican and and uh, uh, um, Massachusetts, Connecticut, your congregationalist, and then there's just the others that have their own kind of colonial traditions on on these matters. But we can all get together as Protestants with some Roman Catholics in Maryland um, to uh, to start this country. And that, that's why, like in John, John Jay in Federalist Two says, we're 
not only common ancestry and other things, but we have common religion. We have generally, we have the same religion. And so we can work together. It's just a reflection of Protestant principles right. that we can mutually affirm each other's faith. So I'm Presbyterian. You know, I've, my, my alleged brother, William Wolf is Baptist, <laughs> but we can, we can, we can be, you know, uh, mutually affirm each other's genuine faith, despite our disagreements on some things. So yeah. then, then that means that he and I could also work on, we can be a, fellow citizens of a kind of a pan-Protestant political order. Now, I noticed, though, in the book, um, historically, when you speak about America, you generally focus on Puritan or Congregationalism, uh, and you don't focus as much on Virginian Anglicanism. Is there a reason for that? I, that's just because my dissertation studies is... Um... Okay, is is in that era. So I I know that I know the I know the new the, the New England Puritans better than the Virginia. Okay, uh, all right, like that South. makes sense. That's just that's just a matter of my knowledge. Yeah, no, I got gotcha. you. Um, all right, so one of the things this is so fundamental we have to talk about it is when uh, people talk about Christian nationalism, I often notice they don't define what a nation is, which I think is such a fundamental discussion. All this, we have to know what a nation is, or else what are we talking about in the first place? One of the things you said, and this is again um, in the introduction, um, <laughs> we got to get past this introduction, don't we? <laughs> Still on page 24. Those who share a culture are similar people. And since cultural similarity is ne necessary for the common good, I argue that the natural inclination to dwell among similar people is good and necessary. And th this is, I think, and, and there, you, you obviously expand on this a lot more in the book, but um, I was hoping you could expand for us here what you meant by that, because this seems to be the point at which you're accused of supporting segregation or something, because you're, um, it, it, I think the assumption that so many must have is that God, if they really trace it back, must have been a racist since he divided everyone at Babel or something. And, you know, will you, uh, it's, I was confused. You just brought up William Wolf. Stephen Wolf is uh, William Wolf probably too. Uh, you guys just want to, uh, shut the borders down. You don't like different people. You want uh, everyone uh, kind of the same and that's just bigoted. And it, so you've, you've already received, I'm sure your fair share of these comments. Um, talk to me about this. What, what is a nation? Is there a genetic component to this? Uh, what are the fat, the, the, the things you would ingredients you would add to a recipe for nation? Yeah. So I'll just start off with when, when I, when I lived in Baton Rouge, I had a friend named Jason. Um, and when uh, when you, if you were to talk to him on the phone, you would think that he was a 10th generation Cajun or something. I don't know he, he, that, that he is a true, uh, Cajun, uh, if, if he were, if you're talking on the phone and he'd tell you how to make etouffee or gumbo, you'd think this guy was been Louisiana forever. He has that accent. It's like, man, this guy must be wearing overalls, you know, have a, a metal roof or something. And <laughs> But but you know, you meet him in person. The guy's 100 percent Chinese, <laughs> and wow. it's 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 pretty funny. It's I mean, we, we kind of joke about it a little bit with him, and he's uh, but he 100 percent Chinese, and he was great great friend. I don't live in Louisiana anymore, but it was one of those it's one of those examples of uh, that it, because I'm from California, and when I live there, he is actually being 100 percent Chinese. He's more Louisiana than I am. And I'm, I'm a white guy in Louisiana from California. He he belong. I mean he he belongs to those to that people more than I do. And and this bad, you know, he's he's hundred percent Chinese. Right. I think he's like third generation or something like that. I forget exactly. But the the point being is that, um, the, the point being is that when when I talk about this idea of similarity. Like people, people, because of, I call it race brain, like people instantly, they, they have to jump to this, like this tick they have about racism or, you know, what they have to jump to that. And what I'm trying to do with the book is actually kind of, you know, deconstruct that a little bit and say, well, wait a second, you need to think about your own experiences in this world that, that, you know, if, uh, I mean, just the other day I was, I was around a group of guys and there was like, uh, most most were white guys, but then there was also a couple of guys who were um, like non-white. And the way that we could talk to each other was if that we were just all kind of the same. So it wasn't so much a there was no like racial barrier or whatever you want to say it. There was no cultural barriers. And so I'm saying is that we, when we kind of think about who are my people, who when we say we, who are we talking about? Just think about the fact that 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 you can that these people that you've experienced life with 
are people you can have common projects with. You can have a common love. You can have shared values. You can have uh, the same affection for places. And, and, um, and so that, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's, so I call it kind of a, like a more phenomenological approach to, to uh, like ethnicity and similarity, just kind of dwell on your own experiences. But people kind of want to, people want to kind of like, they jump to these abstractions of either race um, and then from race, they jump to racism. And uh, I, so I, I just think that like, if we should just kind of bring more to consciousness, the fact that, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of fami familiarity with people around us and we're drawn to these people. Um, and, and yet they are in, in sort of distant national origin different than us, you know? So yeah, I mean, I hope that kind of makes sense. I'm, I'm basically, I'm just yeah. kind of critiquing how people always <clears throat> want to frame things with this, a very objective, uh, like gen almost like a genetic differences when we don't actually live like that. We, we live and we're kind of drawn to similar people not in terms of like genetics but in terms of just these um, like you say cultural similarities more than anything